Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for these character sheets and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe for better advancement opportunities next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Count Dooku and his apprentice Asajj Ventress, two people in an order that only allows two people at a time. And Count Dooku has a boss already, so that's awkward. At least Maul is dead, so we know he won't be competing for the coveted number two position, and it's not like Cities is just gonna start interviewing outside candidates. No, 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 I'm sure these two are gonna be fine. I sense you are one who respects strength, your highness. Our droid armies outnumber the Republic clones a hundred to one. We'll start off with Dooku, he is the master after all, or I guess the cream in the middle of the Sith Ascension Oreo. But a Sith Oreo is a cookie, then cream, then cream, no second cookie, it's why they always lose. Anyway, we need Sith stuff, laser swords, and lightning. Very, very frightening me, mamma mia, here we go again. Goal 2, Form 2, the best lightsaber technique for 1v1ing your opponents who are also using lightsabers. Remember when he's like, Yoda, what if we just use swords instead of the force? And then Yoda did it. Why? A dink is you. You are. Finally, we need Gravitas. Christopher Lee was one of the most charismatic dudes to ever dude. He was Dracula, Saruman, and dropped a couple of heavy metal albums. I bet he even made cheese and gave me red meat because he's the goat. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Dexterity will be number one. Dooku is the duelist to end all duelists. Literally, that's what Form 2 does. Charisma next, the force is an inherent power, or a bunch of space bugs that live in your blood. Both would be charisma. Until Intelligence after that, you need to know the history and details of the Force to use it properly. Well, no you don't, but it doesn't hurt. Follow that up with Wisdom, it's the most frequently used saving throw for Force Defense. Constitution is a bit low, you're still kind of an old man and will dump strength, you tend to lose muscle definition when you lift things with your mind. Dooku is a human, but he's from space, so we'll go custom lineage. That can be anything. It can even be human, that's what Dooku is. Grab the Piercer Feet for your feet of choice, which gives you plus one to your dexterity. You can re-roll one damage die with piercing weapons once per turn, and when you critically hit someone with a piercing weapon, you can add another damage die. Dooku's lightsaber is most similar to a rapier, I would say, and he certainly has a fencing style. The reason we went custom lineage is for plus two to dexterity instead of plus one to two different stats. That's why. I said it in the video. Right there. You don't have to ask why. I explained it. Grab perception for your skill of choice and the sage background for arcana and history proficiency to understand the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Everyone signs up for the Sith Theor 1 story, but I get it. I pay for Discovery Plus just to watch guys' grocery games. We'll kick things off as a rogue because they get a bunch of skills and Dooku is very skilled. Acrobatics, intimidation, persuasion, and sleight of hand are all solid options to be a master swordsman. Sneak attack also helps, letting you deal an extra d6 of damage to an attack when you have advantage on the roll or an ally within five feet of the target. You have to be using a finesse or ranged weapon, but you definitely use finesse with your lightsaber. Expertise will also give you some more finesse, letting you double your proficiency bonus with two skills like sleight of hand and arcana. The sleight of hand will help with the finesse. The arcana just helps you understand midichlorians. We'll bounce over to Warlock now, specifically a Hexblade Warlock to get a magical sword that can cut through anything, eventually. For now you get Hexblade's Curse, letting you pick one other duelist to overtake, critically hitting them on a 19 or 20, dealing extra damage to them equal to your proficiency bonus, and healing an amount equal to your Warlock level plus your Charisma modifier when you slay them. Of course, there's also spells and cantrips for some basic non-combat force push and pull. Mage Hand lets you lift objects weighing 10 pounds or less with a floating spectral hand. For some offensive force pushing and pulling, Eldritch Blast fires a beam that deals 1d10 force damage. It doesn't push or pull just yet, but come on on force damage, that's pretty perfect. For your first level spells, Witch Bolt is a ranged spell attack that deals 1d12 lightning damage on hit, and continues dealing that damage every round for a minute if you hold your concentration. If Sith Lightning isn't your thing, the shield spell adds 5 to your AC as a reaction, helping you deflect attacks. It's basically a better version of the Defensive Duelist ability, which means we won't have to spend a feat on Defensive Duelist. Second level Warlocks get invocations, special ways to augment your Eldritch Blast, and eventually other stuff too. Grasp of Hadar pulls a creature 10 feet closer to you when you hit them with an Eldritch Blast once per turn, and Repelling blast pushes a creature 10 feet away from you when you hit them with an eldritch blast we're only keeping one of these next level so don't get too attached attachment is forbidden to a jedi and you did start off training as a jedi for this level spell hex lets you pick a creature to give disadvantage on ability checks of a certain type and you can add a d6 of necrotic damage to your attacks against them letting the dark side flow through you so your saber will carve through them but for a real lightsaber we need a magical weapon thankfully third level warlocks get a packed moon like pack to the blade that gives you a magical weapon you can summon to your hand as an action you can make it even better swapping one of your invocations for the improved packed weapon invocation, adding one to the attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon, and letting you use it as a spell casting focus so you don't have to worry about keeping a free hand for somatic components, even though you fight one-handed, so 
yeah but also we're not using sun blades because i'm not your dm so i can't give you a sun blade that that's gotta make sense right you can also learn second level spells like hold person which forces a wisdom saving throw on a humanoid failing at they're paralyzed for up to a minute depending on your concentration the force choke isn't just good for immobilizing with form 2 rogues sneak attack that means not only guaranteed sneak attack but guaranteed critical hit which doubles the sneak attack oh and piercer gives you extra damage on a critical hit that's kind of fun for level warlocks get an ability score improvement cap off your dexterity modifier right away for maximum fighting ability we need to provide a challenge to mace windu you're not doing that without a capped modifier actually form 8 directly counters form 2 since the biggest weakness it has is overwhelming power so long story short mace is gonna wreck you but you'll get better at the fifth level of warlock with another invocation like thirsting blade to make two attacks with your packed weapon as an action that can make for a little combo but your sneak attack will only pop on one attack per turn the bonus crit from piercer though works on all attacks so if you hold a person that rapier attack is going to deal 2d8 piercing damage each you also get third level spells like counter spell letting you shut down spells of third level or lower automatically and higher level spells with a charisma check of 10 plus the spells level helping you defend yourself from the jedi we're going to bounce back over to rogue now second level rogues get cunning action letting you dash disengage or hide as a bonus action dashing into melee range is actually probably your best move or it will be at next level that's because third level rogues can choose a roguish archetype like swashbuckler which will give you rakish audacity letting you add your charisma modifier to your initiative and land your sneak attack on creatures when you're within five feet of them and nobody else is within five feet of them that's a free 2d6 sneak attack damage per round when you 1v1 someone or should i say form 2d6 sneak attack damage probably not i've already talked about form 2 way too much you also get fancy footwork meaning creatures you attempt to hit with a melee attack can't make opportunity attacks against you hey if things aren't going your way just stab disengage for free and dash as a bonus action to get away unscathed you also get another way to make your sneak attack happen with steady aim letting you give yourself advantage on one weapon attack per round as a bonus action as long as you don't move that turn maybe we should get something to stop people from running away from us later fourth level rogues get another ability score improvement bump your charisma modifier up for better uses of hold person since that will give you the bonkers sneak attack damage fifth level rogues get uncanny dodge letting you reduce damage by half as a reaction as long as you can see its source try using shield to keep the damage off entirely first but if your dm seems very confident uncanny dodge might be better you also get 3d6 sneak attack damage or 6d6 sneak attack when you get free crits from hold person six level rogues get expertise in two more skills like acrobatics and history you're pretty spry for an old guy and know the jedi and sith versions of history seventh level rogues get evasion letting you take half damage on failed dexterity saves and no damage on successful ones it would be pretty embarrassing if a sith master went out to a thermal detonator but it would be totally understandable if a jedi went down to 4d6 sneak attack damage or 8d6 with a critical hit eighth level rogues get another ability score improvement keep pushing your charisma modifier higher not only does that help your spells it also helps you go faster in initiative so you can close in and start dueling ninth level swashbucklers get panache letting you make a persuasion check against creatures insight checks to do a couple different things depending on whether or not you're fighting them if you're not fighting them they're trying to you for a minute or until Django shoots them if you are fighting them they have disadvantage on attacks against creatures who aren't you and can't make opportunity attacks against anyone other than you so now you can disincentivize people from fighting people other than you baiting them into fighting you by themselves where they're going to lose because you have 5d6 sneak attack damage 10th level rogues get another ability score improvement cap off your charisma modifier for plus 10 to initiative meaning you can always go first 11th level rogues get reliable talent meaning the lowest you can roll on a skill check you're proficient with is a 10 before adding modifiers and rogues get the most skills and expertise it's one of my favorite abilities in the game and it's the best part of being a rogue that or the 66 sneak attack damage 12 level rogues get another ability score improvement or a feat the sentinel feat lets you seriously punish anyone who regrets dueling you you get to make opportunity attacks even when creatures try to disengage you can make an opportunity attack against a creature that attacks another creature within five feet of you and hitting a creature with an opportunity attack sets their speed to zero here's why this is really good sneak attack activates once per turn not once per round so that means when someone tries to leave your threatened space where you most likely have sneak attack from swashbuckler you get to hit them with a sneak attack as an opportunity attack and then they can't leave too bad 13th level swashbucklers get elegant maneuver letting you spend a bonus action to give yourself advantage on acrobatics or athletics checks during that turn basically use it on acrobatics to break out of a grapple it would be miserable if you ended up stuck to someone without being able to leave melee range that's what you do to jedi with 76 sneak attack damage by the way 14th level rogues get blind sense letting you know the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 10 feet of you now the jedi can't run or hide from the dark side that's messed up our capstone is the 15th level of rogue for slippery mind giving you proficiency with wisdom saving throws sure that helps you avoid common jedi mind trick charm person but monks get diamond soul for proficiency in all saving throws at level 14 why do you get something worse a level later just because you get 86 sneak attack damage actually that's fair let's talk about that now that we've hit level 20 let's figure out how viable this build is first you're the humanoid destroyer 
Destroyer. With Hold, Burst, and Hexblade's Curse, Sneak Attack, and Piercer coming together to deal 4d8 plus 16d6 plus 24 damage per round, or around 80 damage with median rolls. Against a target who can't move. Swashbuckler and Sentinel are also a delightful pair, locking people in to fight you at melee range and being pretty much unbeatable at melee range. Finally, reliable talent, expertise, and extra skills from Rogue help you handling things before you start a fight. For weaknesses, remember how Form 8 counters Form 2 with unreasonable power? That's because you only have 100 HP, depending on how you rolled. That means Anakin can kill you twice in one round if you remember that video from last month. Swashbuckler also doesn't work well in a crowd, so try and get someone to chase you away from the fight first. Finally, you only have two spell slots per short rest, so Hold Person's combo could only kill two Jedi per day. But killing two Jedi per day is still a lot of Jedi, relatively speaking. Engage in an honorable duel, then cheat a little bit. You're on the dark side after all. Honestly, the only way you could be better is if you had two lightsabers. It takes two, baby. It takes two, baby. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, Dooku lets you have two lightsabers. That's fun. I bet you two will never fight to the death. Next, we need the Force. Pushing, pulling, choking Jedi. Sometimes two Jedi at the same time. Finally, we need to have Form 2, the form that handles other sword fighters. Asajj is all about the power of two. Two lightsabers, Form 2, two Force chokes, two Js. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want. We have quite a few multi-classing minimums to watch out for, though. Dexterity is one of those, but it makes sense. Your sabers are pretty light. Charisma next, you're scary and persuasive, depending on your preferences. Wisdom after that, it's mental defense, and you're quite the hunter of Jedi. Follow that up with intelligence. You need to hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, also known as the Rise of Palpatine the Asshole. Constitution is a bit low. We're just going to try and keep that damage off, and we'll dump strength. Lots of Star Wars characters drop strength, but that makes sense. I would get real skinny if I didn't have to lift stuff. I make that joke every time, but it fits every time. Darth Amirians aren't a race in Dungeons and Dragons. Hex blood kind of fits the witchy vibe, but Asajj can't cut off a toenail for more magic, and we won't go drow because Asajj doesn't mind the sunshine. Lots of stars in space, you know? So, custom lineage. Wah wah. Telekinetic feat means plus one to a soft stat like Wisdom, the mage hand can't rip for free, which picks up objects weighing 10 pounds or less. Yours is also invisible, and you can shove a creature using your Wisdom modifier as a bonus action on your turns. It's basic force stuff. Bump your dexterity with your two free points, take sleight of hand for your background, and the Sith's apprentice background for intimidation and arcana. I kind of made that background up, but custom backgrounds are just as fine as custom lineage. 100% fine. We'll kick things off as a monk. They're really good at fighting fast. You get two skills from the monk list, like athletics and acrobatics, helping you get the strength of the force for a flip and the nimbleness to land. You get martial arts, letting you make unarmed attacks as a bonus action after you make one with your action, or you can make an attack with a monk weapon, like a short sword. It's basically the same as two weapon fighting, except you get to add your modifier to your kick. Maybe we'll get two weapon fighting later. You don't know. But you can't use martial arts while wearing armor, and Asajj doesn't really wear armor, so it's a good thing you get unarmored defense, making your AC 10 plus your dexterity and wisdom modifier when you're not wearing armor. Second level monks get key points. They can use to do cool apprentice stuff like Step of the Wind, helping you dash or disengage as a bonus action and double your jump distance for the round, helping you make up for your low strength score so you can still get those sweet force hops. Patient defense lets you dodge as a bonus action, giving enemies disadvantage to hit you, letting you fight multiple Jedi at once. Flurry of Blows lets you make two unarmed attacks instead of one with your bonus action. I think you're generally going to be using them for stab or dodging if you're overwhelmed, but it's an option. You also get unarmored movement to make you faster when you're not wearing armor. Sometimes you just gotta bail. And you know Dooku can dash as a bonus action, so if you fight him to the death, you're gonna need that to get away. Third level monks can deflect missiles, letting you reduce the damage of incoming ranged attacks by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier and monk level as a reaction, and if you drop it to zero, you can spend a key point to send it back, deflecting blaster shots like an absolute pro. You also can choose a monastic tradition. Kensei monks can choose weapons to be Kensei weapons, which expands the definition of monk weapons to include any martial a weapon without the heavy or two-handed property. That means long swords are an option. Not for dual wielding, since they're not light, but maybe later. You don't know. With a melee Kensei weapon, you can make an agile parry, adding two to your AC when you make an unarmed attack as part of your action, sacrificing a little offense for some defense. Maybe that sacrifice won't be as intense later. You can also make a Kensei shot to add a d4 to the damage of your ranged attacks with Kensei weapons, which really isn't your vibe. Thankfully though, you do get the ultimate Jedi killing technique with Way of the Brush 
for proficiency with calligraphy supplies. Fourth level monks get slow fall, letting you reduce falling damage by five times your monk level as a reaction. Use the force to cushion your fall. You also get an ability score improvement, pump your dexterity modifier higher for more deadly sword slashes. Fifth level monks get an extra attack, letting you make two attacks instead of one with your action or up to four attacks with your flurry of blows. That's how you 2v1 Obi-Wan and Anakin. You also get stunning strike, letting you force a constitution saving throw on a creature you hit with a weapon attack, stunning them until the end of your next turn if they fail. That'll give you advantage on your follow-up attacks, so it can be a great way to make short work of your enemies. Your monk die also bumps up to a d6, so your kicks will be sicker. Sixer, d sixer. I'm I'm tired, y'all. This is a lot of extra content I'm making. Speaking of sixer, those sixth level Kensei monks get some lightsabers with magical Kensei weapons, making your Kensei weapons magical in terms of overcoming resistances. Now you can carve through anything with your lasers. Also, you can do that with your fists because of key empowered strikes. I don't know why Asajj can do that, but if she punched a metal wall, trust me, it would melt. You also get deft strike, letting you spend a key point to add an extra monk die to the damage of one Kensei weapon attack you make per round, hitting a little bit harder to make life a little bit easier for you. Seventh level monks get evasion, letting you take half damage on failed deck saves and no damage on successful ones. With two lightsabers, you can spin them like a fan and just blow away fireballs. You also get stoneless of mind, letting you remove effects of charming or frightening as an action on your turn. Charm leads to laughter. Laughter leads to joy. Joy, a path to the light side is. Eighth level monks get another ability score improvement, cap off your dexterity modifier and move on to your wisdom score to get the biggest AC you can have. If you're fighting a bunch of people at the same time, the only way you don't die is with really high AC. Or if you bounce over to Bard because they can do real cool sword tricks later. For now, you get an extra skill like religion to understand the lore of the Sith. They eat each other. It's not all that complicated. You also get spells and cantrips. Light lets you make a light to see in the dark with your bad custom lineage eyes and you can affix it to objects or weapons for a saber that's actually light. True Strike lets you remind your audience that it's not enough to ignore bigotry. You need to confront and criticize it directly. Ignoring bigots is indirectly supporting bigotry and being annoyed by people who call out bigotry is directly supporting bigotry because it's suppressing the opposition. It also gives you advantage on a weapon attack next round. It's bad just attack twice or I guess four times in your case. Oh, it's really bad for you. For your first level spells, Long Strider adds 10 feet to your movement speed for an hour to make you even faster than you were. Featherfall lets you totally shut down falling damage for five falling creatures as a reaction so you can catch yourself and your Sith Master and three other people. Um, um, um. Yakko, Wacko, and Dot. Thunder Wave forces a strength saving throw on creatures in a 15 foot cube in front of you, dealing 2d8 thunder damage to those that fail and pushing them back 10 feet for a nice offensive force push. Half damage and no pushing if they succeed. Identify tells you what a magical item is, what it does, and how many charges it has left. You need to know what Sith artifacts you're touching. Some are pretty evil. You also get Bardic Inspiration, a number of d6s equal to your charisma modifier you can give to allies for attack rolls, saving throws, or ability checks. We'll get something to use these on later, though you could use them for Dooku or for Savage when he helps you kill Dooku. Second level bards get Jack of all trades, letting you add half your proficiency bonus to skill checks you're not proficient with, including initiative rolls, so you'll be almost as fast as Dooku. You also get a Song of Rest, letting your allies heal an extra d6 of damage on short rests. You might not think Asajj can sing, but Song of Rest can be Evanescence. That's allowed. Third level bards get Expertise, doubling your proficiency bonus for two skills like Athletics and Acrobatics. You're a very good jumper after all. You can also choose a Bardic College. Sword bards get a fighting style like two weapon fighting, letting you add your ability modifier to the damage of your offhand weapon attacks, making it just as good as your martial arts. You also get Blade Flourish, adding 10 feet to your movement speed when you attack on your turn, and you can spend a Bardic Inspiration die to do cool things if you hit with an attack, adding it to the damage and making a Defensive Flourish to add that Bardic Inspiration die to your AC, a Slashing Flourish to deal that damage to a creature within 5 feet of the first creature you hit, or a Mobile Flourish to push a creature back 5 feet and move within 5 feet of them. You can also learn second level spells like Hold Person, forcing a Wisdom Saving Throw on a Humanoid, failing out they're paralyzed for up to a minute depending on your concentration. That means big nasty crits from your Flurious, Furious save. Four level bards get an ability score improvement or a feat. The dual wielder feat adds one to your AC while you're wielding a weapon two handed. The weapons you wield don't have to be light. That means that you can have two long swords and enjoy D8 damage die as well. Sorry we took so long in a charisma class. We needed hold person and you don't get it from ranger, which is where we're jumping now. First level rangers get another skill like survival to track down Jedi for your boss and candy for expertise in another skill like intimidation to be wicked scary. You also get a favored enemy. You'll have advantage on tracking. Humanoids are included. Most Jedi are humanoid. There's like one gray force user giant elk thing out there but that's in the rebels era so that's not an issue for you second level ranger is where stuff gets tasty giving you another fighting style like dueling to add plus one to the damage of a weapon you're holding one-handed in case you decide to hold a longsword versatile style you also get ranger spells like hunter's mark letting you pick a creature to deal an extra d6 of damage to with your weapon attacks for an hour and that's every weapon attack even your bonus action attacks from two weapon fighting or martial arts it mixes really well together with multiple swords jump triples your jump 
resistance or sex tuples it with step of the wind letting you jump like we didn't dump strength since we're multi-classing spellcasters check page 165 of the player's handbook to figure out how many spells you have at any given level third level rangers can choose a conclave bloom stalkers are edgy as hell thanks to umbral sight letting you see 60 feet into the darkness and creatures relying on dark vision to perceive you can't see you you're invisible you're also a dread ambusher making you move 10 feet faster in the first round of combat you can make one more attack with your attack action in that round and add an extra d8 of damage to that attack then add your wisdom modifier to your initiative it's a lot of stuff gloom stalker is intense the xanathars and tasha's ranger subclasses basically existed to buff ranger up to the level of other classes so they're kind of saucy fourth level rangers get another ability score improvement round up your wisdom and charisma scores for bigger ac and better hold persons hold people we'll round this off with monk levels ninth level monks get unarmored movement improvement letting you move up walls or over water without falling in if you're not wearing armor your speed is also buffed from sword bard unarmored movement long Rider potentially, and in the first round, Gloom Stalker. You're almost a speedster type. That's pretty great. 10th level monks get purity of body, making you immune to poison and disease, including poison damage. Just the character, not you individually. Get vaccinated. Let's not let the quarantine move into year quarantine. I have no hope for 2022. I assume we're still going to be in quarantine for that, but 2023, eh, maybe. 11th level Kensei monks get to sharpen the blade. That lets you spend a bonus action and up to three key points to add plus one to the attack and damage rolls of a weapon per key point you spend. You have this on two weapons at once it just costs six key points and two bonus actions if you max it out which you should because that's fun your monk die also bumps up to a d8 here our capstone is the 12th level of monk for one last ability score improvement get your wisdom higher we can't quite cap it but that's fine dual wielder actually still gives you 20 ac anyway now that we've hit level 20 let's figure out how viable this build is first you're very hard to hit with 20 base ac while dual wielding 22 with an agile parry and the ability to add a d6 to that twice a day with a defensive flourish and 12 dodges from patient defense you're also incredibly mobile with base 50 movement speed with unarmored defense 60 if you make an attack that round an extra 10 feet in the first round of combat and potentially another 10 from long strider not to mention the option to dash as a bonus action and sex double your jump distance finally you're dealing very consistent damage with three attacks per round and spells like hold person and hunter's mark to make all of your attacks hit harder for weaknesses you're a mad woman multi-ability dependent needing dexterity wisdom and charisma to function at your peak so two of those things are going uncapped that also means you can't invest in constitution so you have barely over 100 hp by the end of things finally you don't need two weapon fighting and dueling they're in character but grabbing archery from ranger would make you deadly at any range but form two is all about lightsaber to lightsaber action dooku and ventress are some of the best duelists in the galaxy dive in and show everyone the power of the dark side's deadliest duo maybe just do some team building exercises otherwise your mentorship could turn into a savage rivalry thanks for watching if you like the video subscribe for more we're making double videos every day this month join the patreon for these sheets and a whole bunch more and sub to tulak and mango for more tulak fun